Good afternoon and welcome to all participants to this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a really great pleasure to have such a quality of panels and speakers today to speak about a particular uh, topic which has a, a quite a strong importance for the, the work of Poesy Money Europe uh, in our mission to make the European Central Bank play a stronger role to make these, the economy more fair, democratic and sustainable. I'm Stan Jordan, I'm the Executive Director of Poesy Money Europe and uh, I will just give you a few introductory remarks before I, I, I give the floor to Leah to facilitate uh, this, this session. Um, so I think this, this topic today about the secondary mandate of the, of the European Central Bank is a really interesting one because I've been personally working almost for 10 years before as a journalist, now as, as director of Posimony Europe. And uh, I've been following the, the, the debate on the ECB for the last 10 years, basically. And it strikes me that the number of times the secondary mandate of the ECB has been mentioned in, in all debates and, and you know, parliamentary hearings and in the newspapers, I think the number of times this is mentioned that the ECB has a supporting role for the objectives and price stability is quite uncorrelated with the number of times we can recall when the ECB made particular decision on, on, on this legal basis. So I think this strikes me that as there's so much debate about it, there has not been so much action. Um, but I think perhaps today's discussion will, will enlighten us about why uh, there was not so much action. And maybe part of the reason is too much expectation on this, perhaps the reason that also like too much indeterminacy about what should be done on this. So I think this is why we want to contribute to that debate to not just have another discussion and debate, but actually to discuss how to make that framework, the framework that we have uh, operational. I think that's really the keyboard here, how to make things operational for, for, for us. Um, and so I think, as, as you may know, if you follow our work, we, Pusimuni Europe has already taken a, a lot of uh, initiatives in, in, in uh, strengthening and, and announcing a debate on this. Um, if, you, if you look on our website, you will find uh, that a few months ago, we did uh, an, an opinion piece, an open letter with uh, uh, eight, um, in eight languages on, on this issue with prominent experts such as some of the people in this uh, call, but also with others such as Pervanche Beres, Panikos Demetriades and others who have contributed to putting this debate out. Um, and uh, just two weeks ago, uh, I'm sure you've seen that we released this paper that uh, today we will present. Um, and uh, going forward, I think this debate will, will get even more important because um, um, as you may have seen this morning when looking at the, 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 the monetary dialogue in the European Parliament, uh, this debate has come up again, and the European Parliament has, has repeated its willingness to enter in, in negotiations about uh, how to improve the accountability framework of the European Central Bank and, and, and in the role of the, of, the, of the European Parliament. So I think, at least on our side, what we really hope is that this, this discussion on, on defining better the, the, the secondary objectives of the ECB will find a vehicle to be further discussed and to, 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 to land somewhere and not just be another theoretical debate on what should be done or not on this debate. So that, that's really all I wanted to say for now. I, I won't steal the show from our, 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 some, our splendid uh, uh, panelists today. Um, and just to say thank you very much for everyone here for joining again and for all the speakers to, to take part. And I look forward for a lively discussion, which I'm sure will be also enriched by the quality of the audience uh, that we, we are gathered today. So I leave you the floor to you, Leah, now. And uh, thank you very much for, for, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Um, and thank you, Positive Money, for hosting this event. It's going to be fantastic. And I'm thrilled to be facilitating. My name is Leah Downey. Um, I'm a political theorist. I work on democratic theory and monetary policy, relationship between experts and legislatures. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel. So we have uh, Nick DeBoer and Vienz Van Kluster, who will be uh, offering a summary of their report, which we'll be discussing today, the ECB's neglected secondary mandate. Uh, Nick is a professor of constitutional law at the University of Amsterdam, and Jens is a postdoctoral fellow at uh, KU Leuven and also affiliated with the University of Amsterdam. Uh, responding to Nick and Jens's summary of their report and their findings, we have Sarah Jane Murphy, who is a lead legal counsel at uh, the European Central Bank at the ECB, uh, although she's speaking here in her personal capacity, not as a representative of the ECB, which I'm sure she will tell us also before she gives her comments. Uh, she's also the co-author of a recent paper uh, 
entitled The Mandate of the ECB, Legal Considerations in the ECB's Monetary Strategy Review, which is um, incredibly relevant to the report that Jens and Nick have offered us today. So she's perfectly placed to comment. Uh, we also have Professor Rosa Lastra, who is a professor of banking law at Queen Mary University of London. She's written extensively on central banks, the legal review of monetary policy, central bank independence, and much more. So she will be offering comments as well. Uh, so undoubtedly, we're going to have a fantastic conversation today about what the ECB should and shouldn't be doing, given the current mandate. Uh, so we'll start with a short presentation uh, by Nick and Jens, where they'll review the report. Uh, I'll then ask Sarah Jane and Rosa to comment about 10 minutes each. Uh, Sarah Jane will focus on the paradox presented in the report, and Rosa will elaborate and reflect on the proposed solution of institutional coordination. Uh, I'll then open it up to discussion and we'll have some Q&A with the audience. So we'll be using the Q&A feature on the webinar. So please do submit comments and also vote up those that you find most interesting. Okay, with that, let's uh, let's kick it off. I'll hand it over to Jens and Nick. Um, Jens, you still need it, I think. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Leah, and thanks a lot, Sarah Jane uh, uh, Rosa, for, for being here. Also, thanks a lot for Positive Money Europe for making this launch uh, happen. I'm going to give, Nick and I are going to give a, a very brief overview of our report. If you're really interested, there's not only the report, there's also a number of academic articles and other reports that this report builds on. Uh, but for now, our aim is to really give a, a high level overview of the findings in this specific report. So today I'm going to talk about what is the secondary mandate, why does it matter, uh, why do we think that it is dubiously legal, maybe even illegal for the ECB to ignore it, and also uh, what the European Parliament and the Council, the member states, can do to help the ECB act much more effectively on its secondary mandate. So first, very briefly, what is the secondary mandate? Um, the ECB mandate, really its key provision is Article 127.1 in the uh, Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And there, the first sentence, I think everybody who, who made it onto this call will know its content. The primary objective of the ECB shall be to maintain price stability. But then immediately after that, the sentence that follows this key provision, uh, what we will refer to as the secondary mandate states that without prejudice to objective of price stability, the ECB shall support the general economic policies in the union with a view to contributing to the achievements of the objectives of the union. Okay, so this is a, a slightly less straightforward provision as we'll see in, in more detail. Um, but first, why do we think that this part of the ECB mandate should be getting way more attention than it than it has been receiving so far. Okay, well, I think here, it's really important to look at the history. So the ECB, as it was founded, the, the overarching vision was that of one goal and one instrument. And ECB focused on achieving price stability by setting interest rates in uh, interbank markets. A relatively simple role. And what's happened in the past uh, 10 years or so is that the ECB has come to be confronted with just way more complex questions and also questions, the answer to which is not really provided for in the mandate. Should the ECB buy bonds issued by fossil fuel companies? Should it own 3.6 trillion in government debt? Should it do more against housing and asset price inflation? Should it promote green lending? Now, our aim today is not to answer these questions, but to think more about how procedurally and democratically to go about answering these sort of questions. And we think that now that the ECB is confronted with these sort of questions, the secondary mandate can really have a key role in answering them. To date, however, the ECB has focused on price stability. Uh, ask about what should it buy fossil fuel company bonds. Previously, the answer was yes, this is what we need to do to achieve price stability. Today, the answer is no, climate change is a threat to price stability, so, so we should not. Should the ECB own 
uh, government debt. Very reluctantly, in the course of the Eurozone crisis, the ECB's position became, yes, we should do this to achieve price stability. Other topics, however, ECB has been more reluctant. Should do more against housing and asset price inflation? Should it promote green lending? There, the answer has been, if there's not a very clear connection to price stability, we cannot act. And for this reason, we think that reconsideration of the secondary objectives might be really fitting at this point to improve the quality of monetary policy and give more principled answers to these questions. Nick. Yeah, thanks so much, Jens. So to understand whether the, um, the secondary mandate can help the ECB in addressing these new challenges, it's useful first to look a bit at the text of this provision. So it says, without prejudice to the objective of price stability, the ECB shall support the general economic policies in the union with a view to contributing to the achievement of the objectives of the union. Now, we think it's crucial that this secondary mandate has three uh, sort of key features. The first feature is uh, that it's legally binding. It uses the word shell. Uh, so this means that it really is an obligation of the ECB to uh, support these general economic policies in the EU. This was also confirmed, for example, by a board member of the ECB, Frank Elderson, who says that the secondary objective of the ECB stipulates a duty, not just an option. Now, second key feature of the secondary mandate is that it's supportive. So the idea is here that the European Central Bank should support general economic policies in the EU, but not autonomously make them. So if you think, for example, about the competence to make, uh, take action against climate change or to tackle inequality, those are competence of the EU political institutions and the member states. And the ECB is supposed to not have an autonomous policy making function here, but it supports those policies already existing, uh, already made by other institutions. But then there's a third feature as well, and that's the indeterminacy. And this can be seen in the objectives to which the secondary mandate refers to. So the secondary mandate refers to, uh, it, or the ECB must support general economic policies with, with a view to contributing to the achievement of the objectives of the EU. And these objectives are listed in Article 3 of the EU treaty, but they're very broad and very wide ranging. So they, for example, refer to balanced economic growth, but also to promoting social justice, combating social exclusion, discrimination, uh, achieving full employment, and also achieving a high level of protection and improvement of the quality of the environment. So these are very broad uh, objectives. They can pull in different directions. So it's quite unclear actually what they uh, actually require from the ECB uh, in practice. So the secondary mandate is quite indeterminate. Um, and the treaty also doesn't really specify a ranking between these objectives uh, and, and how the ECB must put them into practice. So this, these, are, these are some challenges relating to the secondary mandate itself. So on the basis of this, uh, Jens and I were wondering in our research, how is actually a secondary mandate used in the practice of the European Central Bank? And we here more or less came to the conclusion that it has basically been neglected by the European Central Bank for most of the time of its history. So if you look, for example, at the 1998 and the 2003 monetary policy strategies, you find a very, very elaborate um, uh, definition of what is price stability and consider considerations related to that, but you find almost nothing uh, on the secondary mandate. You could draw the same conclusion if you look at the communications of the European Central Bank. So we analyzed the speeches of the European Central Bank, and we found there that in all these speeches, the uh, primary objective features in 41 speeches, but the secondary uh, objective hardly features ever. So it was mentioned once in 1998, then four times in 1999, and then it only gets mentioned once in 2002, 2007, 2009 and once more in 2014 and also once in 2016. So hardly ever any mention in speeches. Jens and us also considered how, what was the internal debate within the European Central Bank about the secondary mandate, because there's no really public statement on the secondary mandate. So we did document request and that unearthed um, a document which was classified as strictly confidential uh, in the ECB. Uh, and that document uh, was, was um, declassified following our document request. And there, basically, the ECB explains that by doing price stability, the idea is that it will also achieve secondary objectives. And that story may have been true at some point in the ECB history, but it's much more difficult to maintain now, we think. But if you look at the, uh, the recent monetary policy strategy review of this year, we do find um, more 
uh, reference to the secondary mandate. So the, actually the secondary mandate does feature in the monetary policy strategy review. And for example, you see very much attention to uh, climate change. But if you then look, for example, at the passage relating to climate change, it says climate change has profound implications for price stability. Within its mandate, the governing council takes into account in line with the EU's climate goals and objectives, the implications of climate change for monetary policy and central banking. So here we find again that there's still a focus a lot on price stability. Um, it's not really clear how the secondary mandate features in the ECB uh, practice. Uh, and, and still it becomes also, it's also quite, quite vague and the reference is quite specific. So it's climate change is picked out as one objective for ECB to pursue, but other objectives, it's not quite clear how they relate to this. So based on this conclusion, we find that given that the secondary mandate is a legally binding obligation for ECB, and that it's basically been so neglected throughout the history of ECB practice, we find that this neglect is probably illegal because that basically ignores the legally binding duty that the secondary mandate brings. Um, and we also think that it violates this, the duty to state reasons uh, on behalf of this ECB. Uh, so we think that this, this is a practice that should change. Now we understand, however, that the secondary mandate poses the European Central Bank with a challenge. And that's because of these three different features that I just explained. So it's on the one end, it's binding. So the ECB must act on it. But on the other hand, it's also indeterminate. So the ECB, in order to bring it into practice, it has to specify what it means. But at the same time, it's supportive. The ECB is not supposed to make its own autonomous policy with relating to economic policy. But if it wants to act on this indeterminate mandate, it seems to be in a position to have to make really difficult choices. So to give you some examples, uh, you know, how, what, what kind of objectives must the uh, ECB uh, prioritize? Must it prioritize climate or must it maybe also look at inequality? And even if you then would consider climate change as the key objective, should the ECB then, for example, support nuclear energy or not? Or is that not a green technology? These are very difficult choices. And in practice, it will be hardly possible for the European Central Bank to set monetary policy that supports um, economic policies without also, making, uh, without also making policy itself for this topic. And the way to cut through this knot, uh, to, to reconcile these three objectives, we think is closer coordination between the European Central Bank and political institutions of the EU. So that's back to you, Jens. Yeah. Okay. So how would this look like in practice, right? So now we have a, a broadly uh, a legal story. We have an institutional solution. How should we think of this in practice? Now I'm going to focus on the pro options for, for green landing. But again, first of all, our interest in is in how to do these things procedurally and uh, um, what uh, the actual content of guidance on the secondary mandate is going to be. That, of course, should depend on the democratic process. Now, in practice, there are two steps to giving guidance. So first, the European Parliament and the EU Council should issue guidance, right? And there we have distinguished two aspects of that. So first, they should explain which of these secondary objectives they think are really important, right? As Nick already mentioned, there's this long list of potential objectives and the EP and the EU Council should prioritize, in this case, environmental policy as a secondary objective to support the ECB in acting on this. But also, secondly, as, as already uh, alluded to, what actual uh, green monetary policy should look like is very indeterminate, right? Should it support uh, nuclear energy? To give just one controversial example. Now, here we think that the uh, um, pointing to specific pieces of existing legislation can provide further democratic out input on these details of monetary implementation, specifically the taxonomy regulation spells out what counts as an activity promoting the EU um, environmental objectives, uh, the EP and the EU Council could say, look, we take this piece of legislation to be relevant for the implementation of monetary policy. Now, what's very important in all of this is that none of this constitutes an instruction on the side of the EP and the EU Council towards the ECB, rather. It provides uh, information, evidence, guidance on how to interpret this secondary mandate that is on all accounts already legally binding on the ECB. 
Now then in the second step, the ECB designs monetary policy. In this case, green monetary policy, it's corporate sector purchase program, the Teltros to meet these green objectives. And there, of course, it's very clear from the treaty, the competence to design monetary policy should remain with the ECB. And this is where all the decisions on implementation are made. In a third step, the ECB is, of course, accountable to the European Parliament, but none of anything that we have proposed in the report should be taken as uh, conflicting with the principle of central bank independence. Okay, so to conclude, the ECB now ignores the economic and societal impact of monetary policy unless it affects price stability. We think this may be illegal and it's in any case undesirable. And we think that coordination is the way forward to address this situation. Thanks a lot for your uh, attention and we really look forward to the uh, panelists. Great. Thank you, Jens and Nick. That was a fantastic and concise overview. Uh, I will pass things over now to Sarah Jane. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation to attend the webinar today and to Nick and Jens for sharing the report with me to comment on. As uh, Leah in indicated at the outset, I speak today in my personal capacity, and so the views I'm expressing are, are clearly my own. I also draw in places on uh, an occasional paper that was published on the mandate of the ECB in September of this year, and would very much like to acknowledge the extremely important contribution that was made by my colleague Michael Ioni and by Chiara Zilioli uh, in the preparation of that paper. Today, I'm going to focus my comments on the author's discussion on the paradox of the secondary mandate. And I'm going to look at the three parts that uh, Jens and Nick uh, cover in the report, that is bindingness, indeterminacy, and supportive nature. So if we turn first to bindingness, a core proposition of the paper is that although secondary to the primary objective of price stability, both parts of Article 127 are equally binding on the ECB. And in this context, I'd like to make a literary analogy and suggest that objectives are like animals. So although all objectives are equally binding, some are indeed more equal than others. This is because the treaty provides a very clear hierarchy for monetary policy objectives, which binds the ECB. But at the same time, I think it's very important to recognize that views about the hierarchy have changed and developed very much over time. And therefore, I suggest that rather than judging the past as a period of neglect, it's very important to understand about how views on the objectives have changed and also been influenced in particular by economic thought. So I know that uh, it uh, Nick referred in his presentation to the ECB's monetary policy strategy statement dating back from 2003. Um, the authors have correctly pointed out that no mention is made in that statement of the secondary objective. The exclusive focus of the strategy was price stability. And this is an important issue that legal commentaries at the time were also grappling with. Um, I would refer in particular to the uh, text by Karel van der Berg on the making of the statute, uh, where he argued that there's only one overriding objective, price stability, and there's no goal sharing. Indeed, he claimed that goal sharing would complicate life for the ECB because it had only one stick, the interest rate, to hit two balls, the inflation rate and economic policies, both at the same time. So in this sense, monetary policy used to look like a kind of classic ball and bat game or football and foot game, uh, very linear. Therefore, it, it meant or the implication was that the secondary objective could do no more than ensure that lower interest rates would support economic growth. But then let's wind the clock forward to 2021. And you can see that this presumption that influenced the legal reasoning no longer applies. Indeed, if you look to the first paragraph of the ECB's monetary policy strategy statement, which was published in July of this year, it confirms that economic developments themselves have reduced the scope for the ECB to achieve its objectives by exclusively relying on changes in policy interest rates. It makes it clear that interest rates will continue to be the primary tool, but the ECB will use its complete toolbox of monetary policy instruments and even develop new ones if necessary. It discards the language of conventional and unconventional monetary policy instruments. 
And so I think it's this ability to choose, to design, and to calibrate the set of instruments, which means it's very important to take into account their possible side effects. And for this reason, you can see in the statement that there's a very important emphasis on undertaking a proportionality assessment. So if I can make the analogy to the ball game again, it starts to look more like a snooker game or a pool game where different balls might affect one another. I think it's unsurprising to see that this change in the economic narrative has implications for the legal narrative too. And you can see in this, indeed in the second paragraph of the strategy statement, this describes not only the primary objective, but for the first time, it describes the secondary objectives of the ESCB together with the financial stability objective. Now, of course, we know the secondary objective is subordinate in the hierarchy to the primary objective, and the ECB can only support general economic policies if it's without prejudice to price stability, but there's definitely a new prominence that has not been afforded before in the monetary policy strategy statement to the secondary objective. So just to wrap up my comments on the issue of bindingness, uh, I noticed that the, the authors expressed, including in this discussion today, concern that the new strategy which commits the ECB to take into account the implications of climate change in line with the EU's climate goal, doesn't say so much about how the monetary policy will reflect the secondary objective. I would suggest that the focus on, climate, on the climate change action plan is important, but this is a plan which is still in development. And when we uh, implement the, act, uh, the action plan and introduce legal acts, uh, which reflect the changes that the governing council uh, will decide upon. In that context, the legal basis for each action will need to be confirmed. So an exclusive focus on the climate change action plan, I think, detracts a little bit from the importance of the ECB's secondary mandate that's expressed in the new monetary policy strategy statement. In addition, it's very important to take into account how the economic narrative shapes the legal understanding of the objectives. So if I turn now to the second branch of the paradox that the authors addressed, this concerns the indeterminacy of the objectives. The authors suggest that there's no right or wrong answer to the question of which secondary objectives the ECB should pursue. But this is an argument that I would uh, disagree with in certain respects, as I think it gives insufficient weight to the wording of the treaty. And there are three main reasons for my view. First, I think it's very clear that the ECB needs to support general economic policies in the union. The focus of the support is economic policy, which clearly has a close relationship to monetary policy. I think this is not uh, disputed by the, by the authors. But at the same time, I question whether one cause of the paradox might lie in the indeterminacy of general economic policies in the union, rather than in the indeterminacy of the objectives. We know that economic policy is a matter for member states and the union plays a coordinating role. So there really isn't a single overarching union economic policy that can be identified as the subject matter for support. This is a matter that I know Rosa has pointed to in her report uh, on the Bank of England and the ECB's accountability to the European Parliament, where it's noted that the jurisdictional complexity the ECB confronts is, is uh, very significant. At the same time, however, I would argue that the concept of general economic uh, policies in the Union gives us enough guidance to identify policies that the ECB would be capable of supporting. The Union's policy, for example, which, this is one that was uh, uh, the authors of the report pay a lot of attention to, the Union's policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and achieve carbon neutrality are general because they apply generally to the Union and to all member states. And they're also economic because they touch upon all conceivable aspects of economic policy. Not everybody will agree with me in that uh, analysis, but I think it, it is enough to show that the concept is giving us guidance to help us identify policies that the ECB would be capable of supporting. The second reason I'd place uh, less emphasis on indeterminacy is that the support for the union objectives is only indirect. So we support general economic policies, but with a view to achieving the objectives of the union. It's therefore not very open for the ECB to select the objectives it should pursue that are set out in Article 3 of the Treaty on European Union. Indeed, this choice is much more limited by reason of the need to support the general policies in the union and those who are competent to develop those policies themselves determine the objectives. A third point that's suggested in the occasional paper 
that, uh, that I, I, I worked on with the other authors is that the treaty itself offers the ECB interpretative tools. And these tools can guide it to justify why its monetary policy measures support certain general economic policies and in this way contribute to the union's objectives. So one example that's uh, frequently given is the prioritization that's afforded to certain objectives by the competent authorities in their policies is a matter that the ECB should have regard to. Moreover, it's important to take into account a number of checks and balances that limit and constrain the type of action the ECB can take to support policy. The need to act without prejudice to price stability, the importance of checks such as proportionality that I already emphasized, or the open market economy principle, all play an important role. But the conclusion I'd like to draw is that I'm not entirely persuaded that the ECB is overwhelmed by the range of objectives that it faces, because I think a careful and considered reading of the treaty suggests that a path can be found to address the possible indeterminacy of the secondary objective. Lastly, I reserve a few words to the supportive nature uh, of the secondary objective. The authors argue that it's clear the ECB should not do more than merely supporting the existing general economic policies in the union. This is an argument that I very much support and it aligns with the position taken in the occasional paper. But where I perhaps differ is in relation to the reasoning that it is hardly possible for the ECB to set monetary policy and support economic policy without making policies itself for these topics. So clearly if the ECB makes economic policy, this would be illegal. We, but at the same time, we have guidance from the Court of Justice on how to navigate this path, as it has recognized in the Weiss case that the monetary policy measures can have indirect effects in other policy fields, especially economic policy. And indeed, a measure is not equivalent to an economic policy measure for the sole reason it might have indirect effects in the field of monetary policy. So perhaps one, author, one issue for the authors to further consider is whether the court's guidance might not help us um, and assist us to clarify the relationship between monetary policy and its effects on other areas, because indeed judicial control is a very important aspect of accountability. Now the last point I'd, uh, I'd like to make is that the um, is to comment on the statement of the authors that it would be undemocratic for the ECB to simply design its own policies on the secondary objectives. So yes, this is clearly a point with which I would agree, um, but to wrap up the general direction of my statements, I would assert that it would be democratic for the ECB to act in accordance with its mandate, carefully considered and interpreted. And this really goes a long way to overcome the paradox that the authors have identified. So thank you very much for listening to my comments on the, on the paper today. I also look forward to, to Rosa's comments as a discussant and to the questions that will come in due course. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much, Sarah Jane. I'll uh, pass it over to Rosa for her comments. Thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking Nick and James for inviting me to discuss their important report for the second time. In earlier comments, I pointed out that if this coordination should provide for a sound legal and democratic basis for the ECB's actions on its secondary mandate, it seemed to me counterintuitive that this can be done without being legally binding. But today I will not focus on that. I will focus on the impact of broadened mandates on independence and accountability. As Nick explained, the emphasis in the treaty on the primary objective of price stability, what everyone will refer to as a narrow mandate in central banking, is a development that needs to be understood in the historical context of the latter part of the 20th century, very much in line with the Timbergen rule of one agency, one objective, one instrument. This central bank model relied very much on the conduct of an independent monetary policy, and independence was an instrument in the pursuit of price stability. And I think it's important to take into account the instrumental nature of independence. The wording of the secondary mandate of the ECB was influenced by Article 12 of the Bundesbank law, the Bundesbank Gesetz, which incidentally was the subject of much controversy in Germany at the time. One administrative law expert, Sten, referred in 1980 to this squaring of the circle the, without prejudice to the primary objective. 
But what is new in the treaty, and this is very well reflected in their paper, is the reference to Article 3, which makes the ECB secondary mandate rather indeterminate, as it has been already been pointed out, very broad and discretionary. Interestingly, the debate about the secondary mandate is not unique to the ECB. In the light of climate change with Glasgow COP26 and also the broader agenda of environmental and social sustainability, as well as I would like to say the increasing role of central banks as crisis managers, managers of the global financial crisis, helping to manage also the crisis of the pandemic and now possibly climate change this is a debate that is also taking place in other central banks, such as the Bank of England and the US Federal Reserve System. Indeed, this afternoon as we speak, or rather starting at 3.45, the report of the House of Lords on QE, a dangerous addiction, question mark, is being discussed. I was a specialist advisor in, in the writing and, and the taking of evidence of this report. And incidentally, I think that the, um, as, a, as a practice, this is an interesting example that maybe the monetary dialogue should follow because this was a very extensive inquiry and it's an important measure of accountability. Rather, I sometimes feel in the monetary dialogue, and I have pointed that in some of my reports when I write papers for the expert panel, is very much a lecture than the ECB president gives to the members of parliament. I think it should be much more extensive and asking really tough questions. Anyway, in this report, there are questions about wealth inequality, as well as the wisdom of green quantitative easing, picking winners and losers, all very important issues from the perspective of the distributional justice, that some of the new instruments of monetary policy actually raise a green to the fore. And in the Bank of England in March 2021, at the budget, uh, at the March 2021 budget, the chancellor in a letter to the governor updated the monetary policies committee's remit to reflect the government's economic strategy to achieve environmental growth consistent with the transition to net zero economy by 2050. And it was pointed out that in practice, the change means that the Bank of England will change its approach to buying corporate bonds as part of its corporate bond purchase program. And the bank has said that it will adjust its approach to corporate bond buying to account for the climate change of the issues of the bonds we hold. If we were in uncharted territory with QE, we are clearly in greater uncharted territory when it comes to adopting policies to combat climate change from the perspective of traditional central bank policies, whether that is monetary policy, but also macroprudential supervision and even microprudential supervision. Central banks today recognize climate change as a source of systemic risk to price stability and financial stability. The question is not if, but how and who. So what is the best distribution of tasks between political authorities and depoliticized agencies with narrower mandates? Because a depoliticized agency with narrower mandate brings credibility and depoliticization. On the dangers of repoliticization, I would like to point out that Otmar Isin in oral evidence to the House of Lords stated that central banks have come closer to the political decisions during the financial crisis and now in the context of the pandemic. If to that we add climate change, clearly the dangers of deeply, the dangers of politicization or there or repolitization. I would also like to talk about something that is not necessarily mentioned in the report, but I did talk about it to, to the authors of, of the report, to Nick and Jens, which is the emphasis on financial stability, which in the treaty is relegated to Article 127.5 as a contributory, contributory task for the ECB though it is a clear legislated objective for other central banks. So when we talk about the secondary objective, of course, we have a very broad and indeterminate, but even something as important as financial stability is relegated later down in the treaty to Article 127.5. My last point concerns on accountability. With expanded mandates, central banks require commensurate measures of accountability. When the treaty was enacted, and the reference to the secondary minded, I have to say, had a lot of foresight because it actually accounts for something such as environmental sustainability or climate change. However, what was maybe not given so much thought was mechanisms of accountability, something which I know that Nick and Jens consider in the report as some of the broader things. So the, the mandate of, a, the narrow mandate uh, included in the treaty, measures of accountability that were designed for monetary independence. But what happens when we have 
uh, broad in mandate when we have a multifaceted central banking accomplishing a variety of objectives. And that is in a way what the secondary mandate brings about, many more objectives. If, if there is less consensus around the single mindedness of the objective, are we with that having less consensus about the importance of the instrument of independence, given the instrumental nature of independence in order to achieve the objective? And that's more a question than an answer, something that in a way is an underlying theme, which I would like to point out from the report. Because to me, with multiple objectives and functions, as well as their responsibilities with political authorities, which certainly is the case in the case of climate change or fighting the pandemic, the design of independence and the instruments of accountability ought to be adjusted. In my opinion, a new intellectual template is yet to be crystallized. I think the report by, by Nick and Jens goes some way into that direction, but more needs to be done. Accountability, I wrote a long time ago, is not simply an add-on to justify independence. <laughs> Accountability, ex ante and ex post, is a constitutive part of the design of an independent agency in a democratic system. And an accountable central bank should be judged for the reasonable of its actions by parliament, by the executive, by the public, and by the competent court of justice. I will not get here into the justiciability of monetary policy, something that has been referred before. So my final point is that with broadened mandates, the debate about independence and accountability needs to be readjusted. And in that light, the solution that Jens and Nick propose in the report is an interesting one that tackles the right issues. I should like to encourage them to continue to do more research because with climate change now on the agenda, the issues are likely to point to further debate and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present again uh, some of the comments on the very important and timely report. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Rosa. That was fantastic. So um, we'll start some discussion now. Uh, so please do submit your questions in the Q&A uh, feature, and I will be moderating those. Uh, and as those come in, I think I'll just uh, kick us off. I'll take my, my, my right as facilitator to kick us off briefly with a question for, for Nick and Jens. So I just want to uh, ask about what I take to be sort of an implicit assumption in the report, uh, which is that also found in Sarah, Sarah Jane's report, right, where you, you start from the view that if the ECB has a choice, right, between policy options that contribute equally to maintaining price stability, then it must choose the option, right, which supports the economic policies and names of the European Union and which option it should choose, right, when faced with such a scenario is you convincingly argue, I, I, I believe, very unclear. Um, but my question is, what's to say that such a choice even exists, right, or more to the point, who decides if that's the case? Um, and so, so to put it another way, right, uh, do some of the same challenges that you outline uh, with respect to the secondary mandate also apply in a certain sense to the primary mandate, right? So how the ECB interprets and operationalizes the primary of price stability will determine what sort of space is left over, right, for pursuit of the secondary mandate. And so, you know, this is one explanation for what you point out very convincingly in the report that the, the bank ignored the secondary mandate for so long. And as Sarah Jane pointed out in her comments, right, this is potentially part partially downstream of um, the belief in, in economics at the time, right, that the primary mandate sort of overdetermined or completely determined the policy space. So who decides sort of when that's the case and when that's not the case, I think is a very interesting thing to mull over. And I'd love to, to hear your answer on it, because it seems to me that the suggestion in the report is if we apply the same sort of reasoning you apply to the secondary mandate, that, that the answer would be something like increased coordination between the political institutions and the ECB in defining and pursuing price stability. But then we maybe turn to Rose's question of, does that require us to sort of rethink what central bank independence looks like right now? Um, so that is my question. And please keep submitting your Q&A questions. I will start coordinating those. And uh, Nick and Jens, do you want to respond to any of the comments at this point briefly before we turn to some more questions? Um, so I briefly do the high uh, I overview response and then Nick will uh, draw more on the legal expertise to draw some to answer some of the more very specific questions. So I, I, I really, really very happy with the, the, the comments so far. I think there is really a lot more 
agreement than disagreement. And I think in that sense, that's already testament to what uh, Rose already just mentioned about just the immense evolution that we are currently in the middle of, of which we also don't really yet know where, where, it, where it might end. And uh, I think there, in face of that sort of uncertainty, there are, of course, these really big questions like how democratic should the ECB uh, be and what, what accountability is adequate. I think what Sarah said, I think is probably from a legal perspective, entirely true, right? So you could give a much more sophisticated legal argument on how to draw on the secondary objectives that then we uh, in the report allow for. And I think there it's more the political philosophy doing the work in, in our thinking that we think now this should be a democratic process because of how things have changed rather than that we say uh, the only way to address the current uh, gaps in, in the use of the secondary mandate is through coordination. We just think that is really the best way uh, to do it. And then again, just am agreeing very much with uh, Rosa that what, what these next steps should be is, is at this point very unclear. Okay, that was my very short response. And there are many other things I would still really want to respond to, but Nick. Um, yes, so I, I think um, also, Sarah Jane, we, we, we probably agree that the, the, there is also an indeterminacy in the secondary man in, in the sense that there is, it refers to general economic policies in the union, explicitly not uh, economic policy of the union. Our understanding, I think, here is a bit that monetary policy will unavoidably have effects on, uh, on economic policy. So that's, that for some reason you need to account for them and that we therefore think that having a procedure by which uh, you specify how the ECB should do that is, is helpful. Um, but we also reject, I think, the, the reading of the German Constitutional Court here, where they try to really distinguish between economic policy and monetary policy as if, as if they're quite different, different fields. Um, perhaps on proportionality, my understanding of the principle of proportionality is a bit that, that the, and in the guidance that the European Court of Justice gives us, is that the European Court of Justice doesn't give that much uh, guidance. So it's, it, it requires the ECB to, to state its reasons, um, but it, it's not really willing to delve really deeply into the proportionality of ECB central act, uh, monetary policy. And I think a reason for that, it's very difficult for courts to assess proportionality of central bank action. And, and I think Jens and I would pr probably agree here that that's, that's primarily uh, the proportionality itself is a very tricky political question. And so how do you weigh different effects to each other so therefore also we think that maybe political guidance is, is is probably a better way forward um and maybe one reflection on, on, on rosa's uh, question about independence and rethinking independence i think one difficulty i see a bit with um with this is that on the one end this sort of trade-off between price stability and other factors become much more complicated than was originally thought but the sort of um and there's the, the evidence that um, politics should have more influence in determining price stability objectives is, is also, there's still, there's still a risk of um, a different incentives that the independence was meant to address. So, the, so there we have, uh, it's not quite clear to me how, how independence should be rethought, but those are just some general observations. So I also still briefly respond to Leah's comment, which I think is very interesting and which uh, opens a whole box of further issues. So I, I think broadly we could have two ways of dealing with this price stability objectives, right? One is a very narrow reading, which is 2% um, uh, consumer goods over two year, three year, four year horizon. And I think there's really a lot to say for, for that approach. And then I think as I already highlighted in the motivation of the paper, it's that there has been this huge tendency to interpret price stability in a much broader sense uh, in ways that have a much longer time horizon in ways that are more directly impacted by climate, by financial instability and um, I guess there's also good reasons to do that right so you might also think yes we also need to rethink a bit what 
this much older conception of central banking has to say about monetary stability, about financial stability and the role of the central bank in not just making sure that the prices in the supermarket don't go up uh, three years from now, but also um, yeah, it's a role of guardian of the economy. So I think there, between these two notions, there, there are really arguments on both sides. But I guess uh, from, from a democratic perspective, maybe there's just a lot to say for uh, focusing on, on a relatively narrow definition where the central bank really has very strong autonomy. And once you get to these broader uh, meanings of price stability that also our argument for coordination might might be relevant. Great. Okay, so I'm going to sort of collect a couple of the questions that are coming through and kind of mash them into one for you guys to to respond to. So, so one way of structuring a lot of the things that have been said in the Q&A is sort of what is broadly what you see as the most important largest sort of added value of the proposal as opposed to the sort of existing structure right so some people could argue that you know the ECB could be pursuing lots of different things including a lot of the green uh, policies or support um, that you sort of seem to be advocating for by appeal to the existing secondary mandate as interpreted by the bank or even by appeal to the primary mandate as potentially interpreted right um as you sort of mentioned in your presentation Jens, right price stability relies on the earth and the climate not imploding so you know you can see the types of justifications i'm talking about and then uh, someone else has mentioned that you know are the democratic considerations really as strong as, as as you sort of put them in the piece, uh, given that the governing council, you know, is constructed as it is and has oversight of the ECB. So I suppose the, to the, the overarching question here is, you know, are these, is the coordination that you suggest really required to achieve what you're trying to achieve? Um, and, it, and if so, why? Um, Nick, do you want to, so maybe briefly just expand on what I already said in response to Sarah's queries, which really went in a bit similar uh, direction. I mean, is there a way for the governing council to just navigate all these issues around the secondary mandate by itself? And there, I, I don't know. It's, it's look, I, I think if that's really the direction we want to go, I think it's important to recognize that we have a very different democratic situation than how our central bank independence was initially conceived, right? There, the idea was a governing council that has a very specific, very well-defined objective and one instrument uh, to achieve it. And now we are in a world, well, the, the, the snooker world, uh, as, as we uh, have referred to it, where um, not all uh, goals are created equal and where people very strongly disagree on which uh, goal is more equal uh, than others and how to how to set these um, priorities and then in that world I think it would be a very big step to not think much more seriously about democratic structures around this right so no there's no knockdown uh, argument but I, I do think as a, a sort of uh, political theorist, we should acknowledge that at that point we're moving in a less democratic direction than we were where we were uh, 15 years ago. Do you want to add to that, Nick, or should we move on to the next question? Maybe, maybe, but I think that's a good, uh, good answer. Okay, so that that sort of segues into another another question that uh, we have here, particularly maybe we'll hear from Sarah Jane on this one about the sort of comments that you were giving, uh, implying that you see the existing treaty as offering fairly good when carefully interpreted, fairly good guidance for the ECB on how to interpret the secondary mandate. So there's a couple of questions that seem to be just asking for a bit more specificity on that. And perhaps you could uh, even elaborate on if there's a requirement there for the bank to be perhaps a bit more explicit on the path that it is charting, right? If, if that is in fact what it's doing and how it's interpreting those things. And if the, you know, uh, the more democratic or politically uh, engaged institutions in the European Union wanted to change that path, what might that look like? Uh, 
Thanks very much for the for the question. It's a it's a challenging and an interesting one. Uh, the first issue was about whether there is a need for the ECB to be more explicit in the way in which it would go about describing the manner in which it would take into account primary and in certain cases secondary objectives. And here I think I would refer again to the way in which this was conceived in the new monetary policy statement, where there's enormous emphasis given now to the importance of a proportionality assessment, and indeed specific emphasis given to the importance of a proportionality assessment in contexts where there might be a need for uh, new instruments or instruments to deal with a particular, uh, particularly challenging crisis from the point of view of the of the primary objective. So I think there's a very um, important uh, recognition of the um, the fundamental importance of a proportionality assessment in the context of this of this new conception of of the strategy. And in that context, I think it's also important to bear in mind what was the reason for coming up with a with a new strategy. I mean, one reason for coming up with a new strategy is to um, uh, conceive of the way in which monetary policy uh, will be devised and implemented. But another reason for it is to communicate to people on the way in which it will be um, devised and implemented. And that was a, an aspect of the strategy review that was uh, given a lot of importance and credence, uh, both in the process that was carried out in terms of um, uh, having a dialogue with uh, different experts, uh, civil society organizations, members of the public, et cetera, um, as well as uh, the institutions. So I, I think that this communication aspect is, is certainly not underestimated um, and, uh, and it's an important aspect which goes to accountability. Um, in terms of more, um, more democracy or more interaction with the, um, with the institutions, I would only point to um, the fact that this was addressed in the econ hearing uh, today uh, when uh, members of parliament asked uh, Christine Lagarde about um, the proposal to implement an agreement on um, uh, accountability between the ECB and the um, and the European Parliament, and there she gave a very clear answer, which was that such an agreement would be um, uh, necessary to comply with primary law. That's an obvious uh, principle. It's necessary that it comply with the principle of uh, proportionality. And in her view, it matters slightly less what particular form that takes. What matters is really the substance and the effectiveness and what one really does in order to uh, comply with expectations regarding accountability. So that, those were the core points I wanted to draw attention to in response to your question. Great, thank you. Jens and Nick, did you want to uh, jump in on that? No, feel free. Nick? Go ahead. No, I think um, I, th I think it would be very nice if there would be a new uh, agreement with it between the European Parliament and um, and the ECB specifying certain accountability relations, perhaps, uh, and and that sort of the specifying the secondary objectives could be a key part of that, uh, of that agreement. Great, thank you. Um, I've, gotten, I've gotten a message. Uh, I think Mark is going to allow um, someone to jump in to ask a question by video. Go ahead, Mark. I hope it's working. Um, I, I gave somebody the permission to speak, so you can ask your question now. Yeah, uh, I don't know if the video is going to work, uh, but thank you very much for allowing me to, to jump in. Uh, thank you for this study. It's very interesting. I just want to have one um, remark, a bit aside of the whole discussion, but I think it was being uh, in our mind. I think if you look at the strategy as the ECB has uh, uh, implemented it since some time now, there has been a shift and uh, they have been uh, integrating the secondary objective uh, fully after very difficult debate inside the board. And uh, we know how much it's been a fight against what we call the hawk. And I'm just wondering, not to be too provocative, but still I think we need to have it in mind. 
um, it, what do we want? I mean, are we happy with, with what the ECB is doing and how they are able to, to take on board the secondary objective? Or do we take the risk that if we want clearly to define how the ECB uh, follow the secondary objective, that we would hit a, a, a debate where the hoax uh, would reopen the whole fight and, 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 and work against any capacity for the ECB uh, to exactly follow the secondary objective, which is in the end uh, more helpful than, than, than a damage. Uh, I'm fairly aware to be a bit provocative, but I think in political terms, it's also important to have this in mind. Thank you for allowing me to, to jump in. Thank you for jumping in. That was great. Uh, a great provocation and, and very welcome. And I think maybe we'll, we've reached time, so maybe we should use that to provoke some interesting last thoughts. Um, Jens, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah, and I think this is exactly the, the right provocation because our answer to this is yes. If we have to choose between a situation where now we might have some informal evidence on the positions that different central bankers have taken behind closed door on this position and then have come to a certain conclusion. And when we compare that with a more open a democratic process, then yeah, we think there are really strong reasons to prefer this democratic uh, approach. And yes, democracies make mistakes, right? So it might also be that we then end up with uh, uh, natural gas as a transition energy source in in a taxonomy, but I think this is some risk that we should be willing to take. And um, there is maybe no knockdown argument for saying why we should be willing to take that risk, but that is certainly an idea that's in in the background of of all of this. We're merely showing the way how we should take this risk, and also doing this in a way that I think involves very modest risks to. Uh, central bank independence more generally. And perhaps I think it's very good to hear that the barely secondary objective plays now a big role in the thinking of the European Central Bank. But I think from, from the outside, what we can see in the new strategy is that it's, it's not so obvious how what role it plays and there's still a lot of focus on price stability. So I also with this, yeah, I really look forward to for the substantiation of the secondary objectives in monetary policy decisions and also the climate action plan. But, uh... Great, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thank you very much to the panelists, to the authors of the report and to Positive Money for hosting. So we'll look forward to the next one. Bye everyone. <laughs>